In the heat of the day, near cliffs honeycombed with caves, a peasant boy and his brothers dig for soft soil to be used as fertilizer, a boon for growing crops in the desert. They keep their daggers sharp, for their father has been recently slain and his enemies might be nearby. The peasant strikes an earthenware jar, but hesitates to break it open, for it might contain an evil spirit. He reconsiders after thinking that there might be treasure inside. Instead of gold, he finds 13 papyrus books bound in leather. He takes them home and dumps them on a pile of straw where his mother will use them for kindling. A few weeks later, he and his brothers avenge their father's murder by hacking off the limbs of his killer and ripping out the man's heart, which they share amongst themselves as a communal meal. Fearing their actions might bring attention to their house, the peasant gives the remaining books to a priest for safekeeping, who shows it to a local teacher, and eventually the books end up being sold on the black market, where they come to the attention of museum curators. Muhammad Ali al-Saman, who recounted the story years later, did not realize in the winter of 1945 that he had discovered the only extant copies of the Gnostic Gospels at Nag Hammadi. Gnosticism was a heretical movement that came to prominence within the Christian church in the second century. According to Gnostic theology, the world was created by a divine being known as the Demiurge, identified with the Lord of the Old Testament. The Demiurge rules over all that he creates with the assistance of his angels, known as the Archons, while the true God remains wholly transcendent and alienated from the created world. In some versions of Gnosticism, the Demiurge is just ignorant and genuinely believes that he is the one true God, while in others, he actively hides the existence of the true God in order to maintain his sole dominion over the world. As a result, humanity has a dualistic nature, a body and a soul created by the Demiurge, but also a spirit, or pneuma, which belongs to the true God. The pneuma is a spark of the divine, which has been trapped in the material world, and seeks to return to the realm of the alien god, the Pleroma. Those human beings who possess this divine spark are referred to as pneumatics, and as long as they are kept ignorant of their true nature by the Demiurge and his Archons, they may never escape the world of flesh. Awareness of the true state of creation and of the existence of the true god is referred to as gnosis, or knowledge in Greek. The possession of gnosis enables the spirit, or pneuma, to become aware of its divine origins, escape from the created world, and reunite with the transcendent god, similar to the eastern concept of moksha, or the cessation of samsara, the endless cycles of rebirth, which appears in Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain thought. Their unique soteriology, salvation through knowledge, is expressed in their numerous rewritings of the Christian Gospel. In the Gospel of Thomas, one of the finds at Nag Hammadi, Jesus appears as a Gnostic Savior, come to reveal his knowledge of the indwelling Numa and the nature of his Father, the one true God, who is distinct from the Demiurge responsible for the creation of heaven and earth. If those who lead you say to you, Look, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds will get there first. If they say, It's in the ocean, then the fish will get there first. But the kingdom of God is within you and outside of you. Once you come to know yourselves, you will become known, and you will know that it is you who are the children of the Living Father. The Gnostics offered a unique solution to the problem of evil. How could a good God create a world with so much evil in it? Simple, he didn't. As far as the Gnostics were concerned, the creation of the world could only be attributed to either an incompetent or malicious deity, but not the alien god who transcended all others. This view of creation placed the Gnostics at odds with Orthodox Christian teaching, which held that God had created the world and that creation was good before sin and death entered into the world after the fall of man in Eden. The 
writings of Cormac McCarthy are filled with Gnostic symbols and depict a Gnostic cosmology. A recurring theme in McCarthy's work is that the world is an evil place. In the novel Sutri, the protagonist watches construction workers demolish a poor neighborhood near the Tennessee River waterfront. They are described as Gnostic workmen who would have downed this shabby shape show that masks the higher world of form. In Outer Dark, the tinker tells Renthe, I've seen the meanness of humans till I don't know why God ain't put out the sun and gone away. In Child of God, the deputy asks an old man if he thinks people was meaner then than they are now. The old man replies, No, I don't. I think people are the same from the day God first made one. In All the Pretty Horses, Alfonso proclaims what is constant in history is greed and foolishness and love of blood. Nowhere is this theme more realized than in Blood Meridian, as McCarthy uses all his powers of language to create a vision of the American West that is a terra damnata of smoking slag, a godless quadrant cold and sterile, a purgatorial waste where nothing moves save carnivorous birds, a country where the rocks would cook the flesh from your hands and where other than rock nothing was. Early in the novel, McCarthy describes the survivors of the filibustering expedition sleeping with their alien hearts beating in the sand like pilgrims exhausted upon the face of the planet Anoretta, clutched to a namelessness wheeling in the night. The fictional Anoretta in Renaissance astrology is a malefic planet under whose influence life is destroyed and violent deaths occur. The implication is that our own Earth is malefic, bringing about war and death just as much as Mars and Saturn respectively. McCarthy uses the desolate hellscapes of Blood Meridian to question the nature of the god that created such places. Like the Gnostics, McCarthy believes that the details of creation can tell us something about the character of the creator, and the evidence of design that he discerns in the universe is not comforting. Even the sun in Blood Meridian is depicted as a bringer of hallucination and death, not of light and life, a symbol of cosmic malevolence. They rode on, and the sun in the east flushed pale streaks of light, and then a deeper run of color like blood seeping up in sudden reaches, flaring plain-wise, and where the earth drained up into the sky, at the edge of creation, the top of the sun rose out of nothing, like the head of a giant red phallus, until it cleared the unseen rim and sat squat and pulsing and malevolent behind them. The vastness of the starry heavens are merely an iron vault, keeping the pneumatic man exiled from his home beyond. They were about in the morning before daybreak, and they caught up and saddled their mounts as soon as it was light enough to see. The jagged mountains were pure blue in the dawn, and everywhere birds twittered, and the sun, when it rose, caught the moon in the west, so that they lay opposed to each other across the earth, the sun white-hot, and the moon a pale replica, as if they were the ends of a common bore, beyond whose terminals burned worlds past all reckoning. McCarthy's depiction of the world in Blood Meridian is bleak, but it is not nihilistic. According to the ancient Gnostics, the world was evil, but it was also an illusion, like a desert mirage. Only the transcendent alien god and the divine sparks that are trapped within the material world can be said to be truly real. The Demiurge and his Archons work to keep the pneumatics with their indwelling spirits bound to the creation and prevent their return to the Pleroma. McCarthy hints at the illusory nature of the world in a sequence inspired by Pequod's encounter with St. Elmo's fire in Moby Dick. That night they rode through a region electric and wild, where strange shapes of soft blue fire ran over the middle of the horse's trappings and the wagon wheels rolled in hoops of fire, and little shapes of pale blue light came to perch in the ears of the horses and in the beards of the men. All night, sheet lightning quaked, sourceless to the west beyond the midnight thunderheads, making a bluish day of the distant desert, the mountains on the southern skyline stark and black and livid, like a land of some other order out there whose true geology 
was not stone, but fear. One character in particular recognizes the true nature of the world and revels in it. Judge Holden. The truth about the world, he said, is that anything is possible. Had you not seen it all from birth and thereby bled it of its strangeness, it would appear to you for what it is, a hat trick in a medicine show, a fever dream, a trance be populate with chimeras, having neither analog nor precedent, an itinerant carnival, a migratory tent show whose ultimate destination, after many a pitch in making a mudded field, is unspeakable and calamitous beyond reckoning. McCarthy opens Blood Meridian with an epigram from Jacob Bema, a German Lutheran mystic of the 17th century whose most famous tract, Aurora, The Dayspring, or Dawning of the Day in the East, or Morning Redness and the Rising of the Sun, no doubt inspired the novel subtitle, The Evening Redness in the West. The passage quoted actually comes from Bema's six theosophical points. It is not to be thought that the life of darkness is sunk in misery and lost as if in sorrowing. There is no sorrowing, for sorrow is a thing that is swallowed up in death, and death and dying are the very life of the darkness. Out of context, the quote seems to be a nihilistic commentary on the sinful state of man, but within the six theosophical points, it is clear that Bema is not referring to human beings. The life of the darkness is wherein the devils dwell. According to Bema, we cannot then say of the devil that he sits in dejection, as if he were faint-hearted. There is no faint-heartedness in him, but only a desire that his fierceness may become greater. The devils, so cut off from God that they no longer despair over their separation, rejoice in their own depravity. What is with us on earth that is sorrowing is in the darkness power and joy. Humans suffer and sorrow in the darkness, but the devil does not. The judge is always smiling, always fiddling, and always dancing. That great hairless thing, you wouldn't think to look at him that he could outdance the devil himself, now would ye? The connection between Holden and the devil is reinforced throughout the novel. When he first appears, the Reverend Green cries, This is him, the devil. Here he stands. Elsewhere he is described as a great ponderous gin, and when he steps through the campfire, the flames delivered him up as if he were in some way native to their element. At night he squats on a sandstone ledge, pale and naked, surrounded by bats that come from some nether part of the world to stand on leather wings like dark satanic hummingbirds. When the judge appears just in time to strike a bargain with the beleaguered gang, out of gunpowder and pursued by the Apaches, he looks about him with the greatest satisfaction in the world, as if everything had turned out just as he planned, and the day could not have been finer. When the judge joins the gang, their number has been reduced to twelve, and the judge makes thirteen. They represent a dark parody of the Last Supper, in which Christ and the Apostles numbered thirteen. While these attributes strengthen the association between Holden the Judeo-Christian representation of Satan, in Gnostic thought, the devil and his minions were synonymous with the Demiurge and the Archons who ruled over the world. In fact, Gnostic descriptions of the wicked Demiurge often used distorted features of the Old Testament God. This might further explain Holden's affinity with Moby Dick, as the white whale could be read as a symbol for or agent of the predestinating Calvinist god of New England, so too could the judge be read as one of the Demiurge's archons, if he is not the Demiurge himself. Holden's connection with the archons is alluded to explicitly in one of the subheadings for chapter 15, the Ogdoad, which refers to a circle of eight decapitated heads discovered by the gang. In some versions of Gnosticism, there are eight heavens seven of which are presided over by ruling archons, who seek to prevent Numas from reaching the eighth heaven, the pleroma of the alien god. Holden tellingly knocks over one of the heads with his boot, 
reducing the Ogdoad to a Hebdomad, and symbolically denying transcendence to any ascending the Pleroma. When the kid tells Tobin that he had seen the judge in Nagadochas before he joined the gang, Tobin reveals, Every man in the company claims to have encountered that sooty-souled rascal in some place. The judge, like Melville's great albino, is described as being both ubiquitous and immortal. He never sleeps, the judge. He is dancing. Dancing. He says he will never die. Holden also shares certain characteristics with the Old Testament God. He is jealous, vengeful, wrathful, powerful, and most importantly, he is willful. The very title of judge suggests that he sits in judgment over creation, ensuring all things remain under his jurisdiction. Whatever exists, he said, whatever in creation exists without my knowledge, exists without my consent. He looked about at the dark forest in which they were bivouacked. He nodded toward the specimens he collected. These anonymous creatures, he said, may seem little or nothing in the world, yet the smallest crumb can devour us, any smallest thing beneath yon rock out of men's knowing. Only nature can enslave man, and only when the existence of each last entity is routed out and made to stand naked before him, he will be properly suzerain of the earth. What's a suzerain? A keeper. A keeper or overlord. Why not say keeper then? Because he is a special kind of keeper. A suzerain rules even when there are other rulers. His authority countermands local judgments. Toadvine spat. The judge placed his hands on the ground. He looked at his inquisitor. This is my claim, he said. And yet everywhere upon it are pockets of autonomous life. Autonomous. In order for it to be mine, nothing must be permitted to occur upon it, save by my dispensation. Toadvine sat with his boots crossed before the fire. No man can acquaint himself with everything on this earth, he said. The judge tilted his great head. The man who believes that the secrets of the world are forever hidden lives in mystery and fear. Superstition will drag him down. The rain will erode the deeds of his life. But that man who sets himself the task of singling out the thread of order from the tapestry will, by the decision alone, have taken charge of the world, and it is only by such taking charge that he will effect a way to dictate the terms of his own fate. I don't see what that has to do with catching birds. The freedom of birds is an insult to me. I'd have them all in zoos. But that'd be a hell of a zoo. The judge smiled. Yes, he said. Even so. The earth is the judge's, and he is described as being much satisfied with the world, as if his counsel had been sought at its creation. He may very well have been, for the judge has no beginning and no ending. Whoever would seek out his history through what unraveling of loins and ledger books must stand at last darkened and dumb on the shore of a void without terminus or origin. Whatever science he might bring to bear upon the dusty primal matter blowing down out the millennia, will discover no trace of any ultimate atavistic egg by which to reckon his commencing. In the seventeenth chapter of the novel, Holden gives his grand oration on the subject of war, particularly how the conditions of war, the choosing of one life over another, involve a divine will that gives men over to their fate. The good book says that he that lives by the sword shall perish by the sword, said the black. The judge smiled, his face shining with grease. What right man would have it any other way, he said. Well, the good book does indeed count war and evil, said Irving. Yet there's many a bloody tale of war inside it. It makes no difference what men think of war, said the judge. War endures. As well ask men what they think of stone. War was always here, before man was War waited for him, the ultimate trade awaiting its ultimate practitioner. That is the way it was and will be, that way and not some other way. He turned to Brown, from whom he had heard some whispered slur or demur. Ah, Davy, he said, it's your own trade we honor here. Why not rather take a small bow? Let each acknowledge each. My trade? 
Certainly. But what is my trade? War. War is your trade, is it not? And it ain't yours? Mine too. Very much so. What about all them notebooks and bones and stuff? All other trades are contained in that of war. Is that why war endures? No. It endures because young men love it, and old men love it in them. Those that fought, those that did not. That's your notion. The judge smiled. Men are born for games, nothing else. Every child knows that play is nobler than work. He knows, too, that the worth or merit of a game is not inherent in the game itself, but rather in the value of that which is put at hazard. Games of chance require a wager to have meaning at all. Games of sport involve the skill and strength of the opponents, and the humiliation of defeat and the pride of victory are in themselves sufficient stake because they inhere in the worth of the principles that define them. But trial of chance or trial of worth, all games aspire to the condition of war, for here that which is wagered swallows up game, player, all. Suppose two men at cards with nothing to wager save their lives. Who has not heard such a tale? Turn of the card? The whole universe for such a player has labored clanking to this moment, which will tell if he is to die at that man's hand or that man at his. What more certain validation of a man's worth could there be? This enhancement of the game to its ultimate state admits no argument concerning the notion of fate. The selection of one man over another is a preference absolute and irrevocable, and it is a dull man indeed who could reckon so profound a decision without agency or significance, either one. In such games as have for their stake the annihilation of the defeated, the decisions are quite clear. This man holding this particular arrangement of cards in his hand is thereby removed from existence. This is the nature of war, whose stake is at once the game and the authority and the justification. Seen so, war is the truest form of divination. It is the testing of one's will and the will of another within that larger will, which because it binds them is therefore forced to select. War is the ultimate game because war is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. War is God. Brown studied the judge. <laughs> You're crazy, Holden. Crazy at last. The judge smiled. Might does not make right, said Irving. The man that wins in some combat is not vindicated morally. Moral law is an invention of mankind for the disenfranchisement of the powerful in favor of the weak. Historical law subverts it at every turn. A moral view can never be proven right or wrong in any ultimate test. A man falling dead in a duel is not thought thereby to be proven in error as to his views. His very involvement in such a trial gives evidence of a new and broader view. The willingness of the principles to forgo further argument as the triviality which it in fact is, and to petition directly the chambers of the historical absolute clearly indicates how little moment are the opinions, and of what great moment the divergences thereof. For the argument is indeed trivial, but not so the separate wills thereby made manifest. Man's vanity may well approach the infinite in capacity, but his knowledge remains imperfect. And however much he comes to value his judgments, ultimately he must submit them before a higher court. Here there can be no special pleading. Here are considerations of equity and rectitude and moral right rendered void, and without warrant, and here are the views of the litigants despised. Decisions of life and death, of what shall be and what shall not, beggar all question of right. In elections of these magnitudes are all lesser ones subsumed, moral, spiritual, natural. The judge searched out the circle for disputants. But what says the priest? He said. Tobin looked up. The priest does not say. The priest does not say, said the judge. Nihil dicket. But the priest has said. But the priest has put by the robes of his craft and taken up the tools of that higher calling which all men honor. The priest also would be no god-server, but a god himself. Tobin shook his head. You've a blasphemous tongue, Holden. 
And in truth, I was never a priest, but only a novitiate to the order. Journeyman priest or apprentice priest, said the judge. Men of God and men of war have strange affinities. I'll not second say in those notions, said Tobin. Don't ask it. Ah, priest, said the judge. What could I ask of you that you've not already given? While Judge Holden is the novel's most memorable character, the plot centers on the kid, whose birth begins the novel and whose death concludes it. The kid has no interior life, and the reader never learns his name. His significance is hinted at by the portentous event that coincides with his birth and foreshadows his end. The kid is born in 1833, during the great Leonid meteor showers, remembered across North America as the year that rained fire. The falling stars peaked in November, from which we can infer that the kid was born a Scorpio, under the influence of the red planet Mars, the bringer of war. The Leonids, so named because they appear to descend from the constellation Leo, or the Lion, also foreshadow his eventual destruction in Fort Griffin, Texas. When McCarthy introduces the kid, in him broods already a taste for mindless violence, all history present in that visage, the child of the father of the man, a subversive reference to William Wordsworth's poem of childhood innocence, My Heart Leaps Up. The child is the father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. The lines allude to the Gospel of Matthew. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The ironic allusion establishes the kid as both primal man and would-be messiah. Throughout the novel, though we never get any insight into what the kid is thinking at any given time, we do see hints that there may be more to the kid than just a taste for mindless violence. It might even be that he feels pangs of conscience. He repeatedly tries to help his comrades when they are in need. When David Brown receives an arrow to his thigh, the kid is the only one to volunteer to help him remove it. When he returns to his blanket, Tobin rebukes him. Fool, he said. God will not love you forever. The kid turned to look at him. Don't you know he'd have took you with him? He'd have took you, boy, like a bride to the altar. The kid, despite taking part in their massacres, never really seems to belong to the gang and remains aloof. He cannot give himself over fully to war or the judge because he feels some spark of the divine trapped within, but he lacks the knowledge to express it or act on it. The kid expresses his world weariness when speaking to the old hermit at the novel start. The old man swung his head back and forth. The way of the transgressor is hard. God made this world, but he didn't make it suit everybody, did he? I don't believe he much had me in mind. I said the old man. But where does a man come by his notions? What world's he seen that he liked better? I can think of better places and better ways. Can you make it be? No. No. It's a mystery. Man's at odds to know his mind, because his mind is aught he has to know it with. He can know his heart, but he don't want to. Rightly so. Best not to look there. It ain't the heart of a creature that is bound in the way that God has set for it. You can find meanness in the least of creatures, but when God made man, the devil was at his elbow. A creature that can do anything. Make a machine, and a machine to make a machine. An evil that can run itself a thousand years. No need to tend it. You believe that? I don't know. Believe that. The kid's inability to join the killing frenzy and his penchant for compassion draws the attention of Judge Holden, who recognizes the stirrings of the pneuma within. At the end of the novel, the kid stands before the judge. No assassin and no partisan either. There's a flawed place in the fabric of your heart. Do you think I could not know? You came forward to take part in a work, but you were a witness against yourself. You sat in judgment on your own deeds. You put your allowances before the judgments of history, and you broke with the body of which you were pledged a part, and poisoned in it all its enterprise. Hear me, man. I spoke in the desert for you, and you only. 
and you turned a deaf ear to me. For it was required of no man to give more than he possessed, nor was any man's share compared to another's. Only each was called upon to empty out his heart into the common, and one did not. The kid has failed to ascend the Pleroma, and for his indifference, he is destroyed by the judge in another biblical parody of the final judgment. I know not your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. In the dawn there is a man progressing over the plain by means of holes which he is making in the ground. He uses an implement with two handles, and he chucks it into the hole and he enkindles the stone in the hole with his steel, hole by hole striking the fire out of the rock which God has put there. On the plain behind him there are wanderers in search of bones and those who do not search, and they move haltingly in the light like mechanisms whose movements are monitored with escapement and palate, so that they appear restrained by a prudence or reflectiveness which has no inner reality, and they cross in their progress one by one that track of holes that runs to the rim of the visible ground, and which seems less the pursuit of some continuance than the verification of a principle, a validation of sequence and causality, as if each round and perfect hole owed its existence to the one before it, there on that prairie upon which there are bones, and the gatherers of bones, and those who do not gather. He strikes fire in the hole and draws out his steel. Then they all move on again. The epilogue of Blood Meridian can be read in different but complementary ways. One way is to read it historically. The figure progressing across the plain is creating post holes for the fencing in of the west while bone collectors search for the remains of buffalo, whose nitrate-rich skeletons can be sold for fertilizer. Another way is to read it in terms of Gnosticism, the figure representing a Christ-like revealer, releasing the spirit like fire trapped by God in stones of matter, while the bone collectors search in vain for meeting among the relics of the past. This reading is strengthened by the probable allusion to Milton's Lycidas, in which St. Peter condemns the backsliding of the Anglican Church. Besides what the grim wolf with privy paw daily devours apace, and nothing said but that two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once and smite no more. Another reading is that the figure represents the role of the artist himself. In 1977, American artist Walter de Maria created a land artwork called The Lightning Field in New Mexico by planting 400 stainless steel poles in a grid formation in a strikingly similar fashion to how the figure in the epilogue of Blood Meridian digs out post holes. De Maria's poles strike fire from rocks by drawing it down from the heavens. The lightning field illustrates just how the artist, as Prometheus, stands against the evening redness in the west and how even a novelist can strike fire out of rocks create books out of books, and strive for his own artistic gnosis.